Hello and welcome to Number 5 Chambers' inaugural podcast to our conferences and seminars on all matters planning and environment. I'm Hashi Mohammed, a barrister at Number 5 and your host for this hopefully informative podcast. And now for our part two of the case law update, I am joined by Howard Leafhead and Oliver Lawrence. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Good afternoon, Hashi. Good afternoon, Hashi. Thank you very much. Now, you're both going to update us on the case law developments. And Howard, in particular, you're going to talk to us about the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Now, Richard Kimberlin and Thea Osmond-Smith had spoken about the recent development in the case of Gladman. But of course, the question of presumption in favour of sustainable development is a much deeper one. And there is more case law that helps us understand this question more recently. Howard? That's absolutely right, Hashi. This has, of course, been prompted by the publication of the revised MPPF and the new wording of paragraph 11 in relation to decision taking. There's been quite a bit of uncertainty as to when the tilted balance in paragraph 11D is engaged and how it operates. An example of a case that focused on discrete points is Wavenden Properties. In this case, the High Court provided guidance on the meaning of the policies which are most important for determining the application are out of date in paragraph 11D. The High Court held that the relevant policies need to be considered in the round before concluding whether the tilted balance is triggered. And the court further held that just one out of date policy is insufficient to trigger the tilted balance. And then leading on from this, one of the key points decided by the High Court in Paul Newman New Homes Limited was that while one out-of-date policy by itself was not enough to trigger the tilted balance, uh, that's, of course, Wavenden. One development plan policy is sufficient to prevent the triggering of the tilted balance. And how do you mention the case of Monk Hill earlier uh, about what this means for decision makers? I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that one? Well, what's particularly helpful, Hashi, about Monk Hill is that in this case, the High Court set out a detailed step-by-step approach for decision makers to follow when considering an application. There are numerous steps that decision makers have to take. The first step is to bear in mind that it's necessary to apply Section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004 in any event. Of course, this is that the determination of an application should be made in accordance with the development plan unless material consideration indicates otherwise. And then the subsequent steps take the decision maker through the process in detail, beginning with considering whether paragraph 11C of the MPPF applies, and then moving to set out a number of points to consider in deciding whether and how paragraph 11D applies. Finally, I mean, of course, um, the case of Gladman, we're told, is subject to an appeal. I mean, do you have any concluding thoughts about how this is in the interim going to affect decision makers and uh, the process? Well, Gladman isn't the only case that's going to the Court of Appeal. So there may well be changes in the near future to the High Court's guidance. But for now, at least, decision makers can have some confidence about what is required of them when determining relevant planning applications. Oliver, just building on what Howard has just told us, uh, there have been other cases that are going to be quite important to practitioners, and one in particular in relation to agreeing uh, the extension of time for determining prior approval applications. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, Hashi. Well, one such recent case is the case of Gluck versus the Secretary of State, which centered on the question, can you extend time for all prior approval applications under the GPDO. And the background to the case is is this. As we know, the GPDO permits certain forms of development by requiring that the applicant applies to the LPA for a determination as to whether the LPA's prior approval is required. If the LPA doesn't determine these applications within the time period stipulated by the GPDO, The applicant may rely upon the permitted development rights, provided that the development complies with the terms of the GPDO and get on with the development. So the question as to whether this time period can be extended is very important. So this case was about whether the applicant and the LPA can lawfully agree an extension to the time period 
for determining these applications? And the short answer is yes. Uh, but make sure that the agreement is properly evidenced in writing. There was an interesting point of statutory construction in this case um, concerning uh, the use of the word or. And, and uh, what, what did the court say about that? Well, I'd, Mr. Justice Holgate was persuaded uh, that they were all alternatives to each other. And, uh, and that had the effect that it was lawful under the GPDO to uh, extend time. Yes. And so that's really helpful in terms of the way that, that practically that might work. And there was also another case that's going to be quite useful practically for people um, in relation to the role that's played by the planning practice guidance. Mm. And it's, it's sort of uh, place in terms of understanding how to interpret development plan policies. Tell me about that case. Yes. So this case, it's called Solo Retail Limited versus Torridge District Council. It's a case from last year. The case directly concerned the relevance of the PPG to the interpretation of development plan policy, or should I say uh, the, the limited relevance. And in that case, Mrs. Justice Leaven made various comments addressing the question of how relevant the PPG was as to what development plan policy meant. She said various things. She said the PBG has to be treated with considerable caution in questions like these. She noted the PPG is not consulted on, unlike the MPPF, and it's subject to no external scrutiny, it's not drafted for or by lawyers. The PPG can change without any warning. There's no public system for, for checking it, and, and it is intended, as its name suggests, to be guidance, not policy. And that's really important for those of us who are seeking to find solace in the PPG, where we are unable to find the answers that we're looking for, either in the development uh, plan or indeed in the framework. Uh, thank you very much for that um, update uh, to both of you, Oliver, and to Howard. And that concludes our legal update part two. You've been listening to the Number 5 Chambers podcast, giving you the latest updates on all matters planning and environment.